Smith, Dr. Elias, Neville Mutsemba, and Michael Jackson. And then I do want to acknowledge Carl Greenwich in the in the audience. As you know, Guyana has been bedeviled since the Geneva Agreement back in the 60s by this issue. And recently, given the threats that we have received from our Western neighbor, there have been various concerns up to the extent of panic, I would say, in relation to the border dispute. Part of the problem is that there is such a wide absence of knowledge of the real relevant material in relation to the border dispute that has led to all sorts of speculation. And sadly, given our history politically, um, that leads to different interpretations and uh, the ascribing of motives to various persons. Um, I do not profess for a second to, uh, in this panel. I speak purely on behalf of you, Susan Stovey, the law firm, and that given the wide area of speculation that had developed as a result of the recent actions of our neighbor after we had engaged the ICJ, that that has led to some cases, people may argue, revisioning of history. Um, and uh, more importantly, um, speculation in relation to what would be the appropriate tax or omissions that the country should follow going forward. This, and forgive the is a national issue, very, very, I don't think any space, MCC, the EEZ, and uh, some of you probably were unaware that Venezuela is not a signatory to the offshore maritime Mar treaty, which has other consequences, of what the um, ruling of the ICJ will be. Um, I know there's a high level of confidence in the outcome, but speaking as counsel, you always have to prepare for the unexpected, and therefore it may well be proved options so that we are aware of all options. So the firm decided that given that scenario, it is important that we get the experts to speak to us this afternoon about the border, history, the border dispute, its history, uh, its current status, and its implications. And as we are all keenly aware, we recently signed the Argyle Declaration, and there has been a lot of very um, heated discussion about uh, whether or not that should have been executed. And of course, uh, that in itself generated its own uh, this. Emergency exits, restrooms at the back. And this evening, the introductions uh, to the presenters will be done by Michael Jagnanan, who is one of the associates in Hughes, Suisse, and Stobie. And it is our hope that over the next that we um, are all enlightened by new aspects of this that we might not have heard about. And hopefully this leads to less speculation in, in relation to the consequences. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you both here and those who are on the internet. Um, the event is being streamed both in the Hughes, Fields, and Stoby Facebook page, as well as um, a webinar link that we have shared at the end of all the presentations. And so period of time. So welcome and over to Michael. Thank you very much. New words of praise. Our esteemed panelists, Dr. Elias, Alicia Elias Roberts, Mr. Neville December, and Mr. Ronald Bertsmith. Special invitees, the divisor for this evening, Mr. Nigel Hughes, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, both joining in, us in person and online. Good evening and welcome again to Hughes, Fields and Stobie's public lecture 
on the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. I'm truly honored to stand before you this evening as we are gathered here to hear from our esteemed panelists who are some of minds on public international law and in the practice of law. We do ask that you reserve all your questions until the end of our panelists' presentations, as we will have a Q&A section at the end of all presentations. Now, it is my distinct pleasure you know and held the post of Foreign Service Officer, the second and third, Acting Head of the Legal Division, Director of the Legal Affairs and International Organizations Department, a Legal Advisor to the Ghana Permanent Mission to the United Nations, and Legal Advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the latter being from 1993 to 1997. In 1997, Mr. Bissember was appointed Legal Counsel in the Secretariat of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States in Brussels and Belgium, and served in that post for nine years. In January 2006, Mr. Bissember returned to Guyana to take up an appointment as the Assistant General Counsel in the CARICOM Secretariat, and shortly thereafter, he was made the Officer in Charge of the Office of the General Counsel. He was an advisor in the Office of the Secretary General from 2010 to 2021. He is currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Law of the University of Guyana. Mr. Bissember holds a Bachelor of Laws degree with honors from the University of the West Indies, a master's degree from the University of London, and was a, Humphrey, a hum, Hubert Humphrey Fellow at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Massachusetts, USA. With decades of experience, in foreign relations and international law, I'm certainly looking forward to Mr. Bissember's insights into the Ghana-Venezuela border dispute, and I'm sure all of you are as well. So without fur any further delay, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bissember to the podium. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Um, Nigel, and good afternoon to one and all. You use that term so loosely, Nigel, export, but it's to me like sport. But uh, so thanks for coming out uh, and your numbers. Uh, thanks to Hughes, Fees, and Sobe for the public outreach. I think there's a lot of false information, as Nigel mentioned, and misinformation out there on both sides of the border. Huh? And Guyana really has been losing the PR battle against a slick and well resourced propaganda outfitting Caracas. I, I think that's a fact nobody can dispute. And so this evening's event is timely, I believe, opportune, and hopefully will be both informative and educative. My personal thanks to Senior Counsel, Nigel, for the invitation. We go back a long way. I, I tell people, Nigel, Nigel went to the wrong school. He chose the school and break down with a gray uniform. But he should have come to the school with us uh, on Long Road, the Cream School. Uh, but there's a Redeeming feature, because we both went to pass his year with lessons. He was a few years behind me. And of course, his reputation precedes him. Uh, he's established himself at the bar. You know, sometimes he can be mathematically challenged, but mathematics is not my strong point either. So uh, apart from that, uh, he continues to blaze the trail along with his firm. And all credit is due to them as they continue the trajectory. And hopefully this is one of other outreaches that people could, could follow. Uh, also, thanks to my colleagues on the panel, Dean Elias, President Bert Smith, for lifting the caliber of this evening's offerings. So I said, I should use the term export very loosely. When I joined the CARICOM Secretariat, you know, uh, in 2006, as Assistant General Counsel, the General Counsel at the time was Winston Anderson, now Mr. Justice Winston Anderson, JCCJ. And he had only good things to say about the two interns who had preceded me there, Alicia and Ronald, working, I believe, at the time in environmental and trade issues, respectively. I'm sure their presentations this evening would not only be impressive, but you would see they would have benefited from the exposure at the CARICOM Secretariat. So, so look, I thought um, what I thought I'd do, um, with the concurrence, of course, with, with, with uh, Mr. Hughes, 
and as I said, given the 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 need to dispel some of the misinformation out there, uh, it's addressed this, I call it even mythical or mystical position that our friends on the other side of the border <clears throat> have taken regarding the role and the standing of the International Court of Justice. I think that is one of the foundational issues of contention on either side of the border, uh, the International Court of Justice. And time permitting, you can say a few words about the maritime area of the Escobar Coast, uh, wherein lies much of the focus of the contratum. So to do so, let me go ahead and draw a distinction, right? I think a very important distinction between some of the things that have been said in Caracas. On the one hand, Venezuela says the court has no jurisdiction in this matter. That's one position they take. Latterly, Venezuela's position is that any decision of the court, even now down the road, whenever it comes, will not be binding on them and they will not respect it. It's two separate but not indistinct aspects, right? And let me just say, just as an aside, you know, if you want to play devil's advocate, you need to probably wonder aloud if in the unlikely event that the ICJ was to rule in Venezuela's favor, would they still not respect the ruling? Would they still say that such a favorable decision is not binding? Or is it that they already anticipate that theirs is a losing hand and hence the ruling would be unfavorable? And like the Trinidadians would say, they take in front and they're already decrying and disavowing the findings of a distinguished panel of 15 jurors. I even think there's 16. I think there's an independent panel that we chose a an extra panelist, I believe. I had written elsewhere that notwithstanding the scorn and the disrespect that Venezuela has heaped against the ICJ, they still side fit to have not one, but two of their nationals elevated to serve as judges on the ICJ. So I leave that to the audience to cogitate on that, to draw the relevant conclusions about double standards or opportunism. Because really, quite frankly, you can't be cussing on the court with such vehemence, and yet you sent not one, but two judges to serve on the very same court that you're um, taking offense with. So here's the thing. The decision about whether or not the court has jurisdiction is not a matter for the exclusive determination of President Maduro's government. Right? Not because Maduro says the son of Venezuela rises over the Escobo means that it is so. Not because he says he will issue ID cards to residents in the Escobo means that that will come to pass. Or that the governor, whose appointment emanates from another country, can assume authority in the sovereign territory of a neighboring state. Or that the court has no jurisdiction. Mr. Maduro is not living on an island by himself. He can make those statements all he wants, but at some stage, he will have to come back to reality. Can I have the first slide, please? So as you could see from the first slide, there are primarily two ways in which the ICJ can be seized of the matter. In paragraph one, the parties can refer the matter to the court or such referral may be set out previously in a treaty or a convention or quite simply in an agreement, right? A prior agreement. Uh, let's just leave out the reference to the United Nations Charter for the purpose of this discourse. It's not relevant. Or secondly, the other limb, party A, can declare in advance, this is 36.2. Party A can declare in advance that it recognizes the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. And if so, party B can make a similar declaration and approach the ICJ on an issue. Form part of the advance declaration of party A. So party A can say it submits itself to the jurisdiction for matters related to trade or matters related to borders, or matters related to migration. And it can also say for the period 1900 to 1940. So party B can bring an action if the matter doesn't fall into that time frame, or it doesn't fall into that sphere of uh, operation. All right? Um, I want to leave out the, I want to leave out the compulsory jurisdiction regime, which is below, but it's not really relevant. 
but I'm constrained to say something because of the noises emanating from Caracas. I saw the Vice President, Madam Rodriguez, in a television interview saying that Venezuela historically has never accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICC. And that only 70 odd countries have done so. That, that's a truism. She's right. What she did not go on to say is that the compulsory jurisdiction regime is reciprocal in nature. In other words, if Venezuela has not accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the court, then we, Guyana, could not have approached the court under Article 36.2. And neither has Guyana accepted the compulsory jurisdiction. So it's a non issue. But it's sung good on the television. It makes for a good song bite where she's banging on the table and saying Venezuela has never accepted the compulsory jurisdiction, right? That is theatrics for the media. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, Guyana approached the court under the first limb, 36.1, the normal consent jurisdiction where either you refer the matter, like what Belize and Guatemala did, they signed a joint agreement, let's call a compromise, and together they submitted, or in our case, we had a prior agreement, a treaty or a convention, which is the Geneva Agreement. And under that agreement, that is where the jurisdiction um, originated. So um, it's essential to make that point because of Venezuela keeps saying that it did not consent to the court's jurisdiction. Could you have the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is the famous or maybe infamous Geneva Agreement under which the jurisdiction is born that Venezuela keeps saying this is the only basis upon which the controversy should be solved. When in fact, this is the basis that we're going forward to solve it. This is the basis upon which the matter has been referred to the ICJ. So this is the Geneva Agreement, right? And the operative paragraph is Article 4.2, right? Um, as you can see, the document really sets out a delegate dance uh, involving force of bilateral commission of the two parties which we had tried from 1966 until 1970. We had the Protocol of Puerto Spain. We tried the good the offices, offices, which, which essentially was a bilateral, bilateral arrangement. arrangement. We tried that for what, a quarter of a century? Um, and just for the record, eh, um, it was signed by the UK and Venezuela in 1966. We weren't independent at the time. But Mr. Burnham signed as Prime Minister of British Guyana. And we became a full party upon independence. The United Kingdom fell away. They're no longer interested uh, as an interested party. Uh, but at the time, Mr. Burnham could only sign as Prime Minister of the Colony of British Guyana. But as we were implicated in the matter, uh, we obviously became party to the discussion. Secondarily, uh, there was to be referred to an international organ, organ or to the UN Secretary General. In all these stages, whether for the mixed commission, to the international organization or the Secretary General, the purpose was to choose one of the means of peaceful settlement provided in Article 33 of the Charter to resolve the controversy. The purpose always was to resolve the controversy. And you should bear that in mind going forward. You see how the court arrived at this decision shortly. So let me just pause here and break it down a little bit for you. If you're your landlord, at least five years ago, for you to pay X dollars rent a month for five years, which sum shall be increased in the sixth year to Y dollars. When you now get to year six, you would be obliged under the agreement to pay the increased rent without hesitation or referral back to the landlord or anything. Why? Because you had already agreed to the rent increase five years ago when you signed the agreement. Yeah? I think that is logic, fairly reasonable. If we apply that now to the Geneva Agreement, in 1966, when Guyana and Venezuela agreed that if they could not bilaterally in the mixed commission, that was the four slim, right? In the mixed commission, um, choose a means for settlement, the matter would be referred to the UNSG. I skip over the international organ, because that was never on. The matter would be referred to the UNSG for him to choose the means of settlement. This was agreed to by the two parties in 1966. Like how you and your landlord agreed to raise the rent in advance. Article 33 of the Charter refers to judicial settlement as one of the means to be used. And the ICJ fits under that designation of judicial settlement. And if the SG chose the ICJ as the means of judicial settlement, remember you already agreed with your landlord five years ago 
to pay the rent. How could you now come jumping and railing to say that you never agreed to the ICJ as the means of settlement? You agreed on that since 1966, ladies and gentlemen. You mean to say, otherwise, then you give the SG the authority to choose the means of settlement, right? In Geneva Agreement. But when he chose the ICJ, you're now reneging? Or as we say, backsliding? No, well, international relations doesn't quite work with that. It might work on the island that Mr. Maduro is living by himself, but in the community of nations, things do not work like that, right? So, and you recall, I might have said in Article 36 1 of the statute provides for the consent regime. The parties can either agree together in a compromise or through a prior agreement when it comes to the jurisdiction, which is the one we use, and not the compulsory jurisdiction. You either agree in a compromise, a joint agreement, or you agree in advance in a treaty. So, like Venezuela, you might argue that you never consented to the jurisdiction of the ICJ, right? You might have consented to the SG making the choice, but you never consented to the ICJ's jurisdiction. But you consented to refer the matter to the SG for him to choose the means of settlement. It's a little strange now, part of the years down the road, that you try now to, to sing a different tune. As the old people would say, I mean, you get cat boiled if you do that kind of thing. So look, I'm not making this thing up. Right? The jurisdiction had been founded. Could I get the next slide, please? And rather than hear it from me, you'll see it from the actual decision of the judges. Um, slide three. This is what this is how the court arrived at the fact that they have jurisdiction in the matter. And I just I don't know if you could see it on the screen, but I'll um I'll read it quickly. You said the court. <clears throat> the court recalls that Venezuela had argued that the Geneva Agreement is not sufficient in itself to form the jurisdiction of the court. And the subsequent consent of the parties is required after the decision of the Secretary General to choose the International Court of Justice. That was Venezuela's position, right? However, the decision taken by the Secretary General in accordance with the authority conferred with him under Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Geneva Agreement would not <clears throat> be effective if it was subject to further consent of the parties for its implementation. Moreover, an interpretation of Article 4.2 that would subject the implementation of the decision of the Secretary General to further consent by the parties would be contrary to the provision and to the object and purpose of the Geneva Agreement, which is to ensure a definitive resolution of the controversy. Remember, I said to you, we come back to that. If that is what you set out to do in 1966, to ensure a definitive resolution to the controversy, having given the gentleman the latitude to make the choice, you can't take it back afterwards. You can't go and second guess the Secretary General or third guess the Secretary General, since it would give either party the latitude <clears throat> Would give either party oh my, the power, really like a veto power, the power to delay indefinitely the resolution of the controversy by withholding consent, which is precisely what Venezuela would like to do. They said they don't agree, Secretary General have no authority, we must go another round, which amongst the veto, which with the greatest of respect is nonsensical. For all these reasons, the court concludes that by conferring on the Secretary General the authority to choose the appropriate means of settlement, including the possibility of recourse to judicial settlement by the ICJ, Guyana and Venezuela consented to its jurisdiction. That's not me, that is the court. I mean, I can raise my voice and say it in Spanish so that Mr. Maduro could hear that in Caracas, right? That's not me, it's the court. Uh -uh. The text, the object and purpose of the Geneva Agreement, as well as the circumstances surrounding his conclusion, support the finding. This is how they conclude. It follows that the consent of the parties to the jurisdiction of the court is established in the circumstances of this case. It's not me. This is 15 judges sitting on the Hague, deliberating on a matter objectively. And that's the conclusion they come with. And yet, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Maduro, the foreign minister, and a whole set of other government officials in Caracas continue to say, the court has no jurisdiction. That's why I started out by saying is the distinction between what they're saying and the first limb, with the greatest of respect, 
it's not for the government of Venezuela to decide. It's for the international community to agree with what the um with what the uh with what the court said. So that is how we arrived at the court being properly seized of jurisdiction. Don't worry the noise you're hearing from Caracas. No, they go on to see, right? Um the second limb is that if the ICJ rule, they wouldn't agree with the judgment. If the ICJ has ruled, Venezuela basically continues to say, well, basically, go and jump, take a hike, they're not going to be bound by the decision and they will not respect it. This is second line of the argument. Again, they're on somewhat shaky ground. Not as, I think the first limb, they're really in trouble. That is a decision for the court. This one, of course, a government is sovereign. It can say whatever it wants. But they happen to be members of the United Nations. They happen to be part of the, part of the Club of United International Community. And there are certain obligations that come to that just now. There are certain obligations that they're bound by, right? Um, so while Tommy knows that the ICJ and the UN, they have to be careful. Can we see slide four, please? This is slide four. I'm not making this up. This thing has been in existence in the UN Charter since 1945. Each member of the United Nations, which includes Venezuela, ladies and gentlemen, undertakes to comply with the decision. Ms. Rodriguez stood up. I think Mr. Greenwich was there. She stood up the other morning in The Hague and was very disrespectful to the court. Very, really, I was shocked. And basically, Tom the nose at the court. If they want to continue to do that and go in violation of Article 94.1, which said they must comply with the decision, we would have recourse under 94.2, which deals with a backsliding country, right? Paragraph 2 allows the other party, which would be Guyana, to a dispute to approach the United Nations Security Council for, and I'm quoting, recommendations or measures to be taken against a non-compliant state. Now for the skeptics, who would say, well, there's international law to help with that. In terms of defiance of the Security Council, let me say this. Venezuela is not Russia. It's not a powerful, permanent member of the council that could start a military operation in the Europe and get away with it scot-free. No, Venezuela is not Russia. And they can't just wantonly thumb its nose at the international community. And by the way, Neither are the United States, eh, if you look at the other side of the world. For the pragmatists, let me also add that Venezuela has powerful friends in the Security Council, but so do we. They have the people. We have our people. So if we approach the Council under 94.2, we get very interesting to see how best we can manage that approach. Uh, and it will be left to be seen what recommendations or measures will be taken. Should Guyana have to go the route of Article 94.2? Just bear in mind, please. Guyana, since a couple of days ago, is a non permanent member of the Council for the next two years. And my money is on the distinguished panel of judges of the court, as busy and overworked as they are. I see South Africa just bring a case against Israel. I think Ukraine brought a case against Russia. The International Court of Justice are busy people, and our credit must go to them for coming back so quickly for the uh, provisional measures a few weeks ago with that big dossier in front of them. I still believe they will come back within the time that Guyana is on the Security Council with a rule in which I believe everybody in this room, and even if I tell people, even if I wasn't a Guyanese, I would say that the law is in our favor, the history is in our favor, and they will come back before Guyana comes out of the Security Council in um, 2025. And then we will see under Article 94 whether we need to go and approach the Security Council. Um, let me just wrap up by saying, you know, these things are very interesting when you try to connect the dots. All the nice Venezuela is making here, the jingoism, putting 5,000 troops on the border, telling the United Kingdom to move the vote. All the, the bellicose discussion. Venezuela, ladies and gentlemen, is a chairman of something called the Group of Friends Listen to this, the group of friends in defense of the Charter of the United Nations. Venezuela is the chairman of that, which was established in 2021 after the war broke out, or the, what do you call it, special military operation. 
And this is the copy of a statement by none other than the Venezuelan former president of the United Nations, 2021. I'll just read a few excerpts. Group of friends consider the charter with Venezuela. The group of friends consider the charter of the United Nations to be a milestone, true act of faith. It's a code of conduct that has ruled international relations. Same people that want to invade Guyana and talking about, you know, we tell them about peaceful settlement of disputes and non interference into the same people. Basic timeless principles, such as sovereign equality of state. <laughs> Things joking when I read it. Sovereign equality of states, self determination, non interference in the internal affairs of states. Refrainment from the threat. This is the Venezuelan ambassador addressing the United Nations, talking about refrainment from the threat of use of force. Huh? And the calling us the aggressor? No, please. Please. It says we consider the enduring compliance with and strict adherence to both the letter and spirit of the charter. It's fundamental. <laughs> then there's another section here, really and truly. I mean, these things come back to haunt them, you know. He's saying this regards. While reforming our commitment to efforts aimed at ensuring the maintenance of international peace and security and the peaceful settlement of disputes, we seize the opportunity to voice our concern, etc., etc., etc. To conclude, the group of friends vows to spare our effort in preserving, promoting, and defending the prevalence and validity of the Charter of the United Nations. We reiterate our firm and principal position, support and adherence to the very tenets which not only are. <laughs> I got to laugh. Which not only are legally binding and agreed, agreed rules by all members of the international community, et cetera. This is the same people. Same people that misbehaving here. And you got to drag them, kicking and screaming to a table, using third parties to sit down around the table to try and get some reasonable approach. Yeah? The United Kingdom government sent a boat through here and you got a whole set of nice. 5,000 soldiers have been mobilized. The Venezuelan government has military cooperation agreements with third states. Have this to down those agreements? We haven't complained about it, but we have a military cooperation agreement for training exercises. The UK sent a boat and it's a big set of knives. There are a whole host of foreign military advisors in Venezuela as we speak. Have they removed them? We haven't complained because we have our own approach to dealing with these things. So, as I said, I think the jurisdictional aspect is something that is really foundational. And I thought I'd highlight that. I'm sure my other colleagues will have other things to, to highlight. But that, for me, had been really one of the things that has been irritating me, particularly because of the noises and the misinformation that has been coming out from abroad. And I hope I didn't make this thing up. This is the court. This is the judgment of the court. I hope Mr. Maduro has a Spanish version. If not, somebody should get one for him. Or the next time, I'll raise my voice a little so maybe the Venezuelan embassy around the corner or those in Caracas could, could hear me. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much, Mr. December. Now, as a member of the Practicing Legal Fraternity and the Bar Association, I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Ronald Bertsman. Mr. Ronald Bertsmit is an experienced attorney at law with over 20 years legal experience in practice. He was admitted to practice in Guyana and St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2001. Mr. Bertsmit is a graduate of the University of Guyana and Hugh Wooding Law School. He holds a master's of science degree in international trade policy from the University of the West Indies. And he has also lectured at the University of Guyana in law and development from 2006 to 2015. Mr. Bertsmit, is a partner in the law firm Waldron and Bertsmith and is the current president of the Guyana Bar Association. With decades of legal experience at the bar, I'm certain that we will benefit from Mr. Bertsmith's insights into the Guyana Venezuela border dispute. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bertsmith to the podium. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Happy New Year. I thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you for a few minutes. 
I should start by congratulating the firm of Hughes, Fields, and Stobie for organizing this event. When I practiced in St. Vincent, my firm was called Hughes and Cummings, and for the first few years, I would mix up the two terms. I'm glad I didn't do that this afternoon. The symposium this afternoon is really timely. Um, many others were convened in November and December. I think this is probably the first since the Argyle Declaration. I'm almost sure that we'll have many more as the issues unfold. I should make it clear that my remarks this evening are not on behalf of the Bar Association. I don't know if the disclaimer is really necessary because I don't think anything I have to say would be controversial or disputatious. As Michael was speaking, um, and he referred to my postgrad degree in trade policy in Barbados, I remembered immediately another, what I consider life-changing event. That experience was good, even though I don't practice in anything much to do with trade policy, because it allowed me a chance to understand more about the world around us, the practical aspect of it. And indeed, the other event that I remembered was reading a book called Hidden Agendas, written by an Australian journalist, uh, John Pilger, who died a few days ago. Uh, the book I read was about his experience in covering the war in East Timor, where the people of East Timor were being murdered on a daily basis by the Malaysian regime with weapons supplied by the British government. You can well imagine that reading this in 1997, perhaps at the age of uh, 1920, for the first time in my life, I had this almost visceral experience of considering that the world around me was not quite what I thought it would be. I mean, of course, I'm accustomed to the vices of hypocrisy, um, but seeing this in black and white, that a country that I thought you know, was quite respectable, would be supplying weapons to kill unarmed poor people. It was quite shocking. Really naive, um, but it's the first experience I remember it really hitting home to me as clearly as that did. And what does that have to do with today? Uh, my predecessor, uh, Mr. Basemba, has spoken very passionately about the righteousness of our cause. I don't think there's a single person in this room who disagrees. Uh, Neville's uh, presentation was so passionate that I almost think that he must have had a previous calling as an evangelical or Pentecostal preacher. I'm sure I'll be less passionate, uh, perhaps an intermezzo to cleanse the palate before the presenter which follows me. But there are serious issues to be considered, even though we're confident about the outcome of the proceedings. You recall uh, the anecdote that's spoken about Joseph Stalin's interaction. By one telling it's with uh, Pierre Laval prior to the Second World War, another telling it's with Churchill in the waning days of the same war. But someone communicated to Stalin an observation that the Pope was dissatisfied with some plans that Stalin had for Catholics in Europe. And his reply was simply, the Pope, how many divisions does the Pope have? It reminds us that while military might is important uh, and soft power is in many cases equally important, the absence of military power is something that we really should acknowledge. Ghana doesn't really have military options to deal with Venezuelan aggression. And obviously we don't have the resources or the arrangements that can effectively be a deterrent. Before we get into the details of where we are right now, I think a short recap is warranted. Um, just a few quick dates. In 1840, of course, the Schomburg Line demarcated by the German surveyor Robert Schomburg on behalf of the British government. One of my favorite topics, the early history of British Guiana. Uh, the colony was just formed as British Guiana quite a, just a few years before by the fusion of the colonies of Esquibo de Marari and the colony of Babis. In 1895, the Venezuelan government protested that Great Britain was refusing to engage in arbitration about the ter territory east of the Schomburg Line. And following the Monroe Doctrine, the United States government was persuaded to intercede on its behalf. In 1899, of course, the British government agreed with the United States to set up an arbitral tribunal. 
And in that year, the arbitral award was issued, which was intended to settle the very controversy that we're discussing now. The tribunal met for 55 days in the summer of 1899 and considered it and finally gave its decision later that year, which was intended to be final. The significance of the duration of the time of the sitting of the award has always struck me as being remarkable. And I frequently think about having to work on something of this nature in a strange place without the technology that we take for granted these days of word processing and being able to carry around your whole office on a zip drive. It was substantial work. The issue was considered settled, including by Venezuela. In 1947, uh, the US jurist Otto Schonrich gave the Venezuelan government a memorandum written by a gentleman by the name of Servo Male Prevost, which was written a few years before, which he declared should be published only after his death. Male Prevost, as we all know, surmised that from the private behavior he observed of the judges, there appeared to be a political deal between Russia and Britain, that the Russian chair of the panel, Frederick von Martins, had visited Britain with the two British arbitrators before, and had offered the two American judges a choice between accepting a unanimous award as agreed, or a three to majority even more favorable to the British. The alternative would have followed the Schomburg line entirely, and given the motto of the Orinoco to the British, which of course was something very injurious to Venezuelan interest. And at this point, it's important to know that Venezuela has, until quite recently, celebrated the decision to award the Orinoco to them. Male Privo said that the American judges in Venezuelan council were disgusted at the situation and considered a three to two option with a strongly worded minority opinion, but went along, the Americans that is, went along with the British and Russian president to avoid depriving Venezuela of even more territory. As, of course, uh, Neville has alluded, we have not yet seen from Venezuela any evidence that supports uh, Male Prevost's allegations, absolutely nothing. The memorandum provided further motives for his contentions that there had in fact been a political deal between the judges and led to Venezuela's revival of its claim to disputed territory. I, of course, have never sat as a member of any court. I imagine that the to and fro among jurists um, of a panel such as this over the course of a long summer in Paris could not by itself be the basis for suspicion. The jurists, of course, are all distinguished uh, judges from the three countries. Uh, first, from on behalf of Great Britain, Baron Herschel was nominated at the time Lord Chancellor on his death, he was replaced by Charles Russell, who was Lord Chief Justice. Richard, Sir Richard Hen Collins, one of the judges of the Supreme Court. And on the part of Venezuela, two judges from the United States. Firstly, the Chief Justice of the United States, Melville Weston Fuller. And secondly, another Justice of the Supreme Court, David Josiah Brewer. The fifth jurist was Russian, one of the leading scholars in international law in his time, Frederick von Martins. It's difficult to, not impossible, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the idea that there is corruption in international affairs is not something that should shock anyone. That at five persons as distinguished as this would engage in a corrupt agreement, and apart from a junior clerk writing a memorandum of it, there's absolutely no other record. No one else mentions it, it isn't discussed anywhere. There's nothing else that refers to this. In 1966, on the cusp of our own independence, the Geneva Agreement was established. Um, again, a function of the Cold War dynamics at the time between our colonial masters and the United States. In retrospect, um, quite reckless. But here we are today. From that time, the Mixed Commission has been engaged in finding efforts to seek a satisfactory solution to the problem, followed, of course, by the good officers process under the auspices of the United States, United Nations Secretary General. Neville describes it as a delicate dance, and from the slides that he had offered, you will see that it was intended that the Mixed Commission's work should be a four-year period, and following its work, that there should be consultations. A delicate dance with that was understood to be one song, two songs, three songs, 
we have been dancing for metaphorically a week, a month, a year. For 52 years, we've been in discussions with Venezuela. Finally, in 2018, after analyzing the developments, the Secretary General, exercising the powers that Neville referred you to, under the Geneva Agreement, referred it to the ICJ as the means of final settlement of the controversy. And of course, we launched our case in March 2018. Now, a lot of persons may associate the ICJ or conflate the ICJ with other tribunals. The ICJ, of course, is the principal body of the United Nations located in The Hague. It is not the same as the International Criminal Court. There are institutions called World Courts, and this, this is sometimes described that way, but it's not actually correct. It's sometimes referred to as the Permanent Court of International Justice. Strictly speaking, that name is more correctly associated with the ICJ's predecessor formed after the First World War. Now, long before the war ended, international powers started promoting the replacement for the permanent court. Its express purpose was to prevent growing international tension and conflict, which led to the Second World War. And Mike, of course, has shared with Neville, sorry, the statute establishing the ICJ and the basis of our jurisdiction. Since the case has been trending, from time to time, various issues pop up in, in local discourse, in the newspapers or especially on, on social media, and these things, depending on where you sit or where you stand politically, sometimes take on a, a life of their own. One of the issues that has been trending has been whether or not the issue between Ghana and Venezuela should be called a controversy or a dispute. And I've seen uh, many, many persons, including attorneys at law, insisting that calling it a dispute is a mistake on our part, that really it should only be called a controversy. In reading the Geneva Agreement, you will see that the word controversy is used strongly and very carefully. The word dispute is never, it's never called a dispute. I don't think it's possible that the drafting of the Geneva Agreement would be possible if it it was not an accident that the word dispute is not used. It's quite deliberate to leave out the word dispute. And much is made about it. I, I don't attempt to repeat everything that has been said. In my respectful view, it's a, a bit of a non-starter. The ICJ is not set up to handle controversies. It's handled to manage legal disputes. If you have a controversy, it's expected that it will be published in a newspaper, discussed in academic circles. You'll have bilateral discussions. If you wish to invoke the ICJ's jurisdiction, they only deal with disputes. If I can use a domestic law analogy, for example, the police may be investigated, may be summoned to investigate a quarrel amongst neighbors. Their mandate for law and order may lead them to attempt to mediate or urge parties to maintain the peace. The jurisdiction of the police, however, is a different matter. Unless the police intend to institute charges, they have no jurisdiction. If you want to go to court, it has to be about something that is justiciable. But the point does have some, some great background and province, um, and it is not the first time that the issue has arisen. Scholars on the issue point to the writings of the premier at the time, Dr. Chetty Jagan, in his work, The Western Trial, where he says that the PNC United Force Coalition government jointly signed the Geneva Agreement with the Venezuelan British governments and created the Mixed Commission. Thus, they conceded recognition to the spurious Venezuelan territorial claims, and what had been a closed case since 1989 was reopened. Of course, as with many things in life, there is much that we would wish to change about the 1960s, and if that were at all possible, Venezuela's controversy or dispute would probably be very low on the list of things we would want to change about history. It is, of course, impossible. In relation to the substantive dispute before the ICJ, I thought it was important to discuss what specifically we've asked the court to do. We've asked them to declare that the 1899 award is valid and binding. We've asked them to declare that Ghana enjoys Full sovereignty over the territory between the Esquibo River and the boundary established by the 1899 award, 
if you have the time, it, it may be worth actually reading some of the documents we refer to. I imagine that Mr. Hughes may be able to provide a link. I make them available to him and he can share them with those of you who registered or by some other means or post it on his firm's website. Why it's interesting is that they're all really short. The award of 1899 describes in great detail where the line is. And if you read it, you'll of course recognize the rivers and terrain that it refers to. And it helps to make it seem very real, at least in my reading. We ask the court to order that Venezuela is on an obligation to reflect our respective sovereignty under the agreement. Venezuela should withdraw from the eastern half of Ancoco. Venezuela shall restrain from threatening or using force against any person or company licensed by Ghana to engage in economic activity. Venezuela is responsible for violations of our sovereignty and sovereign rights and for all injuries suffered by Ghana as a consequence. The previous speakers explained some of uh, Venezuela's objections, apart from their concern about whether the Secretary General had jurisdiction. If you uh, read the Venezuelan submissions in its memorial of June 7, 2022, a critical issue for Venezuela, which I thought was perhaps less easy to dismiss than the jurisdiction issue, was the question of whether or not it would be appropriate in the course of the proceedings for Venezuela to fairly complain about British misconduct during the 1899 arbitral proceedings in the absence of Great Britain. The court, however, has resolved that in our favor. But while we all share optimism about the outcome of the proceedings, that's not why we're here. It's not a preliminary victory rally. We're here because there's a very real issue on our Western border. I'll read from the ICJ summary from Ghana's request for preliminary measures. It says that on the 30th of October, Ghana filed a request for the indication of provisional measures in its request, Ghana states that on 23rd October 2023, the government of Venezuela, through its National Electoral Council, published a list of five questions that it plans to put before the Venezuelan people in the now notorious consultative referendum. According to Ghana, the purpose of the questions is to obtain responses that would support Venezuela's decision to abandon the proceedings and resort instead to unilateral measures to resolve the controversy with Guyana by formally annexing and integrating into Venezuela all of the territory at issue in these proceedings, which compromises more than two thirds of Guyana. You do of course know what the questions are and the very nature in which the questions are framed. The obvious answer is yes. A, a really, a really wicked, but you know, inspired act on the part of the Venezuelan government. Again, is of course, in the provisional measures it sought, sought to restrain the injunction, the referendum, which the court felt it was unable to go so far, but instead said, pending a final decision in the case, the Republic of Venezuela shall refrain from taking any action which would modify the situation that currently prevails. Both parties shall refrain from any action which might aggravate or extend the dispute before the court or make it more difficult to resolve. Immediately after this interim order was made and the referendum was held, uh, Venezuela, of course, has continued to issue statements which have caused tremendous political and social tensions. You're all familiar with the invitation from the chairman pro tempore, uh, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, Prime Minister of St. Vincent, and his invitation of the 14th of December to President Maduro and Ali to come to St. Vincent for talks. His letter says the leaderships of the states of Latin America and the Caribbean and the Caribbean community consider that it's necessary and desirable to facilitate the convening of a meeting in St. Vincent between the presidents of Guyana and Venezuela on matters consequential to the border controversy between these two great countries. And then, of course, as Dr. Gonzalez has given so quite a lot of flourish around it. Core words an invitation to discuss matters consequential on the border controversy. The Argyle Declaration made on that day has been the subject of much scrutiny and debate, and to use the two recurring words, perhaps controversy or dispute. I am not sure how many people would agree with me, but in my view, the Argyle Agreement has no strictly speaking legal significance or meaning. It's not a legal document. It's a political document intended 
in my view, to provide President Maduro with an off-ramp to lower the rhetoric on the controversy, which had been stirring for many years. As we all know, the Venezuelan conundrum is entirely of their own making over the past 60 years. It's a convenient whipping boy. It has given, for the past seven to five years, a greater credence to Servo Mali Prevost's fantasies. And it's one of the few things in Venezuela that I believe they all agree with. But the importance of this to Venezuela, whether legitimate or not, is a political reality that our leaders must face. It is a problem of their making, a political problem of their making, but it is now also our political problem. And global political problems are not resolved by questions of who is right or wrong, or turn, they turn on questions of might, and what is in the best interest of the mighty. As it appears, the United States is now supportive of Ghana's claims, but these are not permanent circumstances. We are here largely because of the United States. The U.S. support is not without costs or consequences. And just as mouths are muzzled by the hands from which they derive bread, our reliance on U.S. diplomatic or perceived military support turns on us being a reliable partner, whatever the United States considers partnership to mean. Our friends in China have their own fish to fry or their own chow mein to boil. <laughs> The People's Republic of China has long-standing territorial claims on Taiwan and just about every country in the South China Sea. They have a dispute, including the United States, all the way in the Western Hemisphere. On the hundreds of atolls and the new artificial islands that China has set its sights on, it's not in their interest to intercede. Our diplomatic relations with Russia are less than what they once were in any event. Venezuela appears to have much more sympathy from Russia. Russia's unilateral annexation of the Crimea in 2014 and its broader campaign in Ukraine suggests that unlawful unilateral action by Venezuela would not be unprecedented. It is true. Venezuela is not Russia. We are also not Ukraine. The United Kingdom government has been vocal in its support and can be counted on for diplomatic assurances and polite comforts. They've been kind enough to redirect what's called a river class offshore patrol vessel to visit Yan. Please look it up on Google. It's a little bigger than a speedboat. Given the lack of our own divisions, as the Pope discovered, what are the consequences of Venezuela's aggression or breach of the ICJ's order? It is true. Article 94 does provide recourse to the Security Council. It is important to note that Ghana has membership of the Security Council, for which we it's something we should be proud of. But the Security Council members have veto powers. The permanent members, Russian Federation, People's Republic of China, the United Kingdom, the United States, and France can veto any decision of the Security Council, any one of them. Let's say the ICJ were to rule in our favor, and let's say the Security Council within the next two years, somewhat ambitious to expect the case to finish then. But let's say we got to that stage where Venezuela was the subject of a resolution being considered by the Security Council. Would we expect Russia to not veto a resolution? Would we expect China to not veto a resolution? Children are being slaughtered in Gaza. The Security Council can't pass a meaningful resolution. Or TIF with Venezuela. Are they, are we, do we feel as sure about the Security Council as we feel about ICJ? In my respectful view, it's pointless to entertain confidence about the result of a case in court if the enforcement of the judgment is close to impossible. It's not a good analogy, but the realest one comes up frequently in litigation or in court proceedings. You have an aggrieved spouse who is the subject of violence from her intimate partner. She seeks the protection of the court, or he seeks the protection of the court. But the party that's subject to the orders of the court is a belligerent actor 
has nothing to lose, does not respect court, is unconcerned about his or her reputation. What use, therefore, is a flowery order and a stern warning from a court of law if the other party cannot be restrained, at least in an efficient manner, by an order of court? So we spent significant time as a community in the last few weeks, uh, fortunately interrupted by the Christmas season, debating whether or not the Argyle Declaration undermines our position in the ICJ or vice versa. Persons who said the Argyle is a waste of time. Why are we talking to Maduro? We need to go to court. Well, as I pointed out, we don't have a military problem with Venezuela. We don't have a legal problem with Venezuela. We have a political problem. A political problem requires political solutions. In that sense, the question I'd like to leave you with is really, what is the difference between the outcome of Argyle and the outcome that we hope to achieve at the ICG? I'll save the rest for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Birdsmith. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Alicia Elias Roberts. Dr. Elias Roberts is no stranger to the field of energy and environmental law, as she has over 20 years of experience as an energy and environmental academic and consultant. She has done consultancies for several international organizations and various governments in the Commonwealth Caribbean. She has written over 20 published journal articles chapters and academic books and edited books with reputable publishers. Dr. Elias Roberts has a law degree from the University of Ghana, a master's of law degree from the University of Oxford, a master's of law in energy, environment and natural resource law from the University of Houston. She also has a PhD focused on energy development law from Queen's University, Canada. Dr. Elias Roberts is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the St. UE St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, Dr. Elias Roberts was my lecturer during my studies, uh, my undergraduate studies at University of the West Indies. Most aptly, she taught me public international law, which is what we we're concerned with today. And even back then in 2018, when this case had just started before the ICJ, I can recall Dr. Elias raising lively and informed discussions regarding the Ghana-Venezuela border dispute and its potential impacts. I have no doubt that Dr. Elias Roberts will offer valuable insight into this border dispute and perhaps continue that discussion and its recent developments. And so without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elias Roberts to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocol has been observed. Good evening and Happy New Year <laughs> to my fellow panelists. To, I must say good evening to Mr. Carl Greenidge, to Stephen Fraser, my lecturer for when I was a student at UG. I see many familiar faces in the audience. Mr. Bissemba, fellow panelists mentioned that we have the common link, the, the panelists here, of all working at CARICOM. Yes, that common thread, working for the Caribbean community. And I see in the audience, Mr. Vincent Alexander, I worked with at the University of Guyana, Jem Sanford, attorney at law, Sir Bobby Vera, Carlos Adams, Claire Jones, so friends, countrymen, students, former students, good evening. I've already been introduced. Next slide. Right, so I am the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the UE St. Augustine campus, but this evening I'll not be speaking in my capacity as a Dean on behalf of the UB, but rather in my own personal capacity as an academic and given my own perspectives on the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy 
what started as a political controversy and now, in my opinion, is a legal dispute before the International Court of Justice. I want to thank Mr. Nigel Hughes for this um, opportunity and for organizing this lecture for the firm Hughes Field and so be sponsoring this lecture. And Mr. Hughes, you're one of Guyana's great legal minds and you're a person who your contributions transcend the courtroom. You shape the very fabric of justice and legal profession in Guyana and abroad. So thank you for this opportunity and organizing this. Next slide. Right, so this is a brief outline of what I'm going to do this evening. I'm going to go through what we already heard, a bit of the historical perspective. I'm going to talk a bit about the case before the International Court of Justice. What I haven't heard so much from my other panelists about the role of the company that is involved, a major company, the Exxon Mobil Company, and the U.S. interest and what that might have with this whole political controversy going to the ICJ, in my opinion, that it's quite coincidental that in 2015, we have that announcement of oil and commercial quantities there, and then Guyana making the decision, and we've already heard of the Secretary General taking the matter to the court. Right, so, so there are some geopolitical implications also that I will highlight that my fellow panelists had mentioned, and then some of the recent developments with the Venezuelan referendum and the court provisional measures and so on. Thanks. Right, so if you can see these three agreements I have highlighted here on this slide, that the sanctity of treaties and agreement is an important principle in public international law. And my fellow panelists made a reference to these agreements, but I have them in this way so that I think when you see the picture, you can understand the difference from the Washington Treaty. So the US urged British Guyana and Venezuela to have this arbitration. So they entered into a Washington Treaty and they recognized that the award that they're gonna have will be a full, perfect and final settlement. So that treaty from 1897, then later had the composition of the arbitrate, arbitral tribunal that we agreed upon that that will be a full, perfect and final settlement. So at the time it was a colony, British Guyana. So the UK was involved. The UK was a party to these agreements. Venezuela agreed to this. And on international law, you have to respect borders and frontiers. You have to respect the final settlements. You have to res respect arbitration. So what could set this aside? That is the conundrum that Venezuela is in, that you had this issue about who owns the Esequibo. Is it based on occupation and control, prospecting for gold and diamond, Schomburg lines? Who owns the Esequibo? Is it based on discovery? Going back, how far back do we go? If we were to upset borders internationally, just imagine the chaos we'd be in. That you go back to the native Amerindians, who owns the territory? <laughs> and at which point in history? So to agree that this is how we will finally resolve this and it will be final and settled, that is what happened in 1897. And then in 18, the, the arbitral award there, that was agreed upon. And thereafter, Venezuela celebrated. They felt, okay, they were happy with the decision that they got certain rights to the Orinoco River. They didn't get all of the land in the Esquibo. That went to... The British, but right after the award, Venezuela was happy with it. Subsequent to the award, that wasn't the end because now you have to actually demarcate the territory. So you have to have a commission set up. You have to have persons who will go and identify where exactly, how do you map out that area and draw up that line? So that's why you have these different agreements. So a few years later in 1905, you had another agreement that Venezuela agreed to pass these things into law that this is how the territory will be defined. Next slide. So we know this is Guyana. I'm a proud Guyanese, so I'm a bit biased with my presentation, but this is Guyana. And I can't imagine any court saying otherwise, that this is recognized as Guyana internationally. That was the award, that was the boundary, that was a perfect settlement agreed upon. Next slide. 
Right. So Venezuela wanted to change its position in 1962, and several things happened. We already heard from some of the other panelists about the letter that was to be read after this junior officer passed away and presented as evidence that this arbitral tribunal with the most distinguished jurors was corrupt and there was fraud. Fierce allegations, but where is the evidence of that? There's no strong evidence that there is actual corruption and fraud. Because the British said, well, let us have an, let us have three parties coming together, the UN, the British in Venezuela, and look at the evidence. They spent a few years after Venezuela alleged that, okay, there's fraud and we're not going to respect this. And Venezuela could not provide evidence to set aside this award. Because that's a serious allegation. You have to come with strong evidence. Guyana was preparing for independence also. In 1962, Chetty Jagan had announced his position in terms of certain political ideologies, communism, things at the UN that in the documents that were submitted, the application to the ICJ, there is a hint there that maybe it was the political ideology at the time that the Venezuelan president had said, we don't want another Cuba in South America and things of that nature that cause this bogus claim of fraud to set aside this award that you had respected for over 60 years. So in 1962, you're trying to get this set aside to say that you've changed your position and almost threatening Britain that they should not give independence to British Guiana with the boundaries, as we saw in that previous slide, that the boundaries should remove the entire Esequibo. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of the actual agreement from 1966. So what happened is that British, right before independence, we know we gained independence in 1966, three months before, agreed with Venezuela that we will be a party to this treaty and recognize this controversy. It was carefully worded. Next slide. So there's a provision there, Article 1, saying that you're going to have a mixed commission with the task of seeking a satisfactory solution for this problem, this controversy. And notice it says Venezuelan contention that arbitral award of 1899 about the frontier. So it's almost like saying, we don't know what you're talking about. You're, you have to prove, he who alleges must prove this. You're saying you have a problem with the borders. You prove this. This is a Venezuelan contention. And this is what the agreement, this is kind of the language in the agreement. And the next slide, we already heard from Mr. December about Article 4 and what it provided for, that if the party should fail to settle this controversy, then you can involve the Secretary General of the UN and he can refer to methods under the United Nations Charter. So Article 33 makes reference to judicial settlement, and that is how the court can get jurisdiction. That's how the matter can go before the International Court of Justice. So Venezuela is alleging that the court does not have jurisdiction. So for so many years, you have a problem, and you're trying to settle it bilaterally. But why the hesitancy to have it final and resolved? You want it unsettled. It was a political controversy, that's my opinion. It was political, but now taking it to the court, it is legal. Next slide. So is there any merits to this? To the Venezuelan claim, I would say no, because you have a long time, many years, to bring your evidence and prove your contentions that there is fraud, prove your case. The treaty remains a full, perfect, binding settlement to the controversy. It was settled, and there are so many principles of international law on the side of Guyana that we have a strong case. So there's no evidence in support of the Venezuelan claim. What Venezuela was saying in terms of the jurisdiction, and this is what some persons may not understand, is that the International Court of Justice is not a court that has inherent jurisdiction. The International Court of Justice requires the consent 
of the states. So Venezuela is saying, we didn't really consent. They don't want a case before the court. <laughs> they, want to say, they want to have bilateral negotiations and discussions with Guyana, right? So Guyana say no, but we obtained a consent through the treaty that back in 1966, before we gained our independence, you with the British said that we will try to resolve this. And if certain methods fail, this could be a mode of settling it. Because then, as Mr. Bissemba said, it would be futile. You'd always veto and say, we don't ever want to go to the court. Next slide. So what Venezuela has done over the years has been steady aggressions and violations of international law. The Ancoco Island incident, right after independence in 1966, Venezuela military forces seized the eastern half of this island in the Cuyuni River. So the diagram is kind of showing you a little jotted line there, part that belongs to Guyana, part that belongs to Venezuela. Venezuela built a military installation, a strip on the Guyanese territory, despite Guyanese objections. So Venezuela is showing you that it will not respect Guyana's territorial integrity, its sovereignty, and would flagrantly violate international law. Next slide. This is another incident, and there's so many that were highlighted in the application before the International Court of Justice. So I'm just highlighting a couple here to show you that in this um, RV Technique Pernada Maritime incident in 2013, there was an armed Venezuelan Navy vessel detained by Venezuelan military. So it was doing seismic research in Guyana's waters, in Guyana's exclusive economic zone. And Venezuela is saying, oh, this is an area that there is disputed reclamation area. It's within their territory. So the vessel was detained and then they were subsequently released, caused a big international scene. But this is just setting the tone for the potential, what Venezuela can do and why. When you look at how things escalated and where we're at today, why it would be necessary to go to the court? Next slide. Right, so over the years, a lot has happened. As this slide indicates, um, in terms of trying to work with Venezuela. So Guyana didn't just wait like two years, five years, and then went to the courts. From 1966 all the way to 2018 before the application, there were attempts at mixed commissions. There was a moratorium, a protocol of Port of Spain. Nothing should happen. And this affects Guyana's investment in that area, right? When you have these agreements and these concessions, good officers being appointed to negotiate with Venezuela, but this political controversy on the part of Venezuela continue to grow. Next slide. So the case before the ICJ, surprise, surprise, Venezuela rejects it because they want to continue. It should not end, I guess. It's a myth over there that it should just continue forever, that you know, various political, like, it's like a campaign point we will reclaim the yes, Equibo. And, and it should always be there as something that they feel like a victim about. But with Guyana, it affects our investment, it, aspect, it affects our economic development, and is serious in terms of our territorial sovereignty. That's one of the main elements of a nation is your borders and we, how you define yourself. It's one of the important elements as you become independent as a state to know and define yourself. Next slide. So what is interesting here is that in 2015, after the announcement of oil in commercial quantities, President Granger had the agreement in 2016 with Exxon, renewed agreement, and there was this secret 18 million Exxon fund. And one of the things that President Granger had said is that the money would be used to fight the case, to fight our borders. It was going to be placed in a special fund. So next slide. I know everything I say, people may not like, but I just want you to think about things. Why Guyana changed its position? Think about that. Guyana was willing to negotiate with Venezuela for many years. But in 2015, things changed with oil that Guyana is like, we are going to court. So we all hear that the Secretary General took this matter to the ICJ, because that's provided for under the 1966 Geneva Agreement. But the Secretary General can only act on the consent of the states. So 
let us be very clear that Guyana took this matter to the court because Guyana made the application. So it's not like we didn't want it to go to court. Guyana took the matter, the application to the court. And this happened when Exxon became involved in 2015, right? So a lot of things happened. And one of the um, panelists already went through some of the things that Guyana has been asking for the validity of the award that was final, binding, and perfect. We want to get that arbitral award acknowledged that this is equitable, it is Guyana's sovereign territory. There are other things that Guyana requested of the court that the court said no, right? So some of the other things in terms of the threats by Venezuela for Ancoco Island, threatening use of force, why would the court say no to certain things and yes to others? The court requires your consent. The court operates. The jurisdiction is limited to the state's consent. And going back to the 1966 agreement, the court said only things up to that point we will review in terms of consent coming through with the 1966 agreement and the SG saying refer to the court. But things after more recent events, we will not have jurisdiction. So next slide. So that's what the court said by 12 votes to four that it had jurisdiction to entertain the application regarding the arbitral award. But in terms of the matters happening subsequent to the Geneva Agreement, no, it would not entertain that. So the jurisdiction is limited, but this is a win for Guyana because Venezuela is like kicking and screaming. It does not want to recognize the jurisdiction of the court. Next slide. So Venezuela also objected, as um, Mr. Bert Smith mentioned, that the UK should be involved in this case. So they had a preliminary objection that you have a party, a third party, who has an interest in this matter, which is a very good argument. But surprisingly, the court said no. They still found that they can go ahead. What the court said is that, yes, the UK was the signatory today agreement in 1966. You're not independent. The UK signed the treaty, but the UK intended that you become independent and you resolve this with Venezuela. So it's the two of you, Venezuela and Guyana, that would have to settle this. And the subsequent practice of the states after 1966 was that the two of them tried with the mixed commissions and the different things. It didn't involve the UK. So how now coming to the court, you're saying, hey, the fraud is on the part of the UK. You're an interested third party and they should be in this case. So the Guyana won again. So the writing is on the wall. Next slide. <laughs> when you have contentious litigation, you have a winner, you have a loser. And we're seeing who's going to win in this case. And Venezuela is almost like preempting and preparing themselves for the outcome of that judgment. Some of the issues before the court involved, of course, the respect for the international system that we want to settle disputes peacefully on the United Nations Charter, your principles and various modes of settling disputes peacefully. You have to respect treaties. There's the Vienna Convention of Law of Treaties from 1969 that entered into force in 1980. Practice and serve on the principle to observe treaties in good faith. Prohibition against the use of force. What will happen though is that even though the court is saying it's not going to look at a prohibition against the use of force by Venezuela, the implication of finding on the first two elements, it will implicate the other issues that the things that happened after 1966 by Venezuela is a violation of the prohibition against the use of force. Next slide. Right, so what are the implications of having a legal dispute? So I said, in my opinion, it was initially a political controversy that has now risen to the level of a legal dispute because we know that the court will only entertain legal disputes. There, there are many cases in which they have said, if it's a mere political controversy, it will not entertain it. We look at the disagreement over some factor law, conflict of legal views, different interested parties and so on that would give the court jurisdiction. So of those various modes that you have on the article 33 of the UN charter, to have mediation, conciliation, negotiation, these different things. Guyana tried that for a number of years. Now it's time you go to the court, it's the highest level and it is adjudication, it's adversarial, winner and loser. 
But Guyana made that decision that we are taking this to court, right? Even though I see a lot of, you know, media and commentators that it's the SG that took it to the court. I have my own perspective on that, that Guyana and also a certain company influencing Guyana in 2015, suddenly there was a change in how we treat with Venezuela. And that was included in the Venezuelan memorandums to the court. A lot of reference to certain companies operating in Guyana. So maintaining the status quo. Next slide. There is a concept under the Law of the Sea Convention that pending the delimitation of your maritime borders, states should cooperate and refrain from doing things that could affect or jeopardize the region of a final agreement. That at the end of the day, states have to come together and settle their maritime boundaries. Venezuela is not a party to UNCLOS, as Mr. Yu said earlier. So what does that mean? This is not a customer international principle. So many of the concepts under the Law of the Sea Convention, they reflect custom. What that means is that even though the United States hasn't ratified UNCLOS, Venezuela is not a party, they'll be bound by these things because what is within UNCLOS reflects custom. But this one does not. So many of the provisions dealing with dispute settlements and so on, you can't force a state that is not a party to that treaty to abide by that. But nevertheless, you should take light of it, take note of these things. Next slide. So in this case of um, Ghana and Kudivar, I just wanted to point out that these two states had a maritime boundary dispute. So not a dispute about the territory, but how to delimit your maritime zones, do you use some equidistant special circumstance or another way of drawing up the lines? And while the dispute was before the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea, the, there's a special chamber that granted provisional measures saying that the states should take steps to suspend all, all ongoing oil exploration, exploration in the disputed area. Refrain from granting new permits for oil exploration in a disputed area. So the court at the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea, which Venezuela is not a party to, by the way. Venezuela is kind of a rogue state with many international tribunals not wanting to submit itself to a lot of tribunals and jurisdiction. But this is interesting to note that you can go to a court and say, we have a dispute about a territory. If you are both signatories to that treaty and say, pending the delimitation of our maritime boundaries, this is what I want. And the court granted these measures so it took a few years before it was settled. But in the interim, um, go to the next slide. If you see here, the different lines with the red and the yellow and so on, and the jotted line, where you have Ghana at the top and Kudivar at the top. So those are the territories, the coast, and the blue area, that is the sea. And those brown things, those are different um, oil exploration. This impacted their operation that the provisional measures for a few years, which is like billions of dollars to the companies, that you have installations out in the sea rotting and you can't do anything because the court said that like a moratorium until we settle the dispute, that that could happen. But pay attention, it affects investment, but that could happen because they want to maintain the status quo. And because of time limits, I'm not gonna go through a lot of the jurisprudence in some of these cases, next slide. Just to notice in Guyana, Suriname maritime boundary dispute, the court did look at certain things in terms of what you can and cannot do when you have your maritime zones not being delimited. And what the court has said is that where you have overlapping claims, it doesn't give rise to international responsibility when you do things that will not jeopardize the reaching of a final agreement. So there are certain things you can do, like you can do certain survey seismic tests and so on within the area, but things that could ultimately affect the reaching of a final agreement. Those are things that of course may say provisional measures. Each case will be dealt with by its own particular circumstances. So this was a case of when before the permanent court of arbitration in 2007. And interestingly, the tribunal found that um, both Guyana and Suriname had violated their obligations on the unclosed where they had failed to take every effort to enter into provisional arrangements relating to exploratory activities in the area before they determine 
and reach final agreements about their maritime delimitations. But what it means is that when you have neighbors and you have these maritime boundaries, you have to at some point meet and agree on the delimitation. Next slide. The role of the international companies. So yeah, the companies out there and the reservoir is out there. Sometimes these reservoirs will straddle boundaries. There's something to think about that do we have the data on the geology of the area? And if the reservoirs straddle, what legitimately is Venezuela's um, zone? That where you have the Starbrook block, because there's no rule of capturing international law, meaning who brings it to the surface first owns it. But do you want to get into some kind of a unitization agreement or joint development agreement if you have friendly relations with your state to jointly develop, even when you don't settle the boundaries, there is that possibility. That has happened in many other jurisdictions around the world where states recognize the reservoir straddle the borders and rather than rushing to extract first, they will try to agree on how they can move with that. So next slide is just showing the extent of the Starbuck block, what's happening and Venezuela's claim. Next slide. So very ambitious when Venezuela is claiming this as a reclamation zone there. So a lot of what is happening out there then in their mind is their territory, their victim, and we are extracting their resources. So that's part of their um, beef. Yeah, next slide. Geopolitically, we heard from um, Mr. B we heard from the other panelists about some of the implications with other organizations and other states that this dispute between Guyana and Venezuela will have. It impacts the UN and the International Court of Justice. The U ICG is the principal judicial organ of the UN is there to give guidance and a final judgment. CARICOM, Ghana is a member of CARICOM. CARICOM member states with the petro deal in the past, looking for something new in the future maybe. How do they decide which side to take? Union of South American states, both Guyana and Venezuela, they're part of this regional grouping that talks about protection of sovereignty, respect for boundaries and peaceful settlement of disputes and so on. OAS, so many international organizations that will all confirm to rules of international law, the rule of law and the respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, peaceful settlement of disputes, the non-use of force, et cetera. So these are things that will all be on Guyana's side. Amazon Cooperation Treaty. So a South American agreement Guyana shares the Amazon with several South American countries, including Venezuela and Brazil and so on. So there are agreements that impact Guyana and Venezuela, and this dispute will affect that. Brazil, after the settlement of the boundary, Brazil had a subsequent agreement, that a tri-junction agreement with the both Venezuela and Guyana that affects their boundaries. So do we open up all the boundaries now if we're to disregard the award of 1899? Think about the implications for all of these other agreements. Next slide. Right, so St. Vincent, I have a question mark here. So maybe you can tell me in the audience your views on um, the role <laughs> of St. Vincent to this um, issue, Trinidad and Tobago, have a special history with Venezuela. Unitization agreement, current dragon field development for natural gas. So Trinidad currently developing with Venezuela and they had to get sanctions lifted by the US for Shell and other US companies to operate out of Trinidad with Venezuela. So they have, you know, all these issues, it's multifaceted and dynamic in terms of how will we go forward after the judgment? Next slide. And this is just some picks to think about. Caribbean leaders want Petro Caribe back. And I like the um, headline they were saying, thirsty neighbors now seek some other agreement. Thirsty. <laughs> Next slide. And this pitch, I think, speaks volumes of relationships with some states in the region and Venezuela and the role that they will play going forward. We have to know our allies, we have to know our partners who we are negotiating with as a state to be sensible 
Next slide. And this is about um, Trinidad signing the Track and Field Agreement in Venezuela recently. So it took many years in the making to get that done, to get that agreement. You know, Trinidad has been operating for over 100 years. They're what you call a mature province that mostly gas now. And this is very important to their economy. So they have to do what's in their interests. All right, next slide. So this threat is so important to Guyana as we know it, that Sir Trinidad Ramphal had said it's an existential threat to Guyana's existence before the International Court of Justice. And I agree. So next slide. So Venezuela had a referendum, different rhetoric coming out from Caracas about the impact of that, how many persons voted, what it means. Well, as a state, they can do that. They have their right to have a referendum within their state, but if they act upon it and it impacts us, it's a different question, yes. So what they have said is a threat to us. It undermines our existence. The Esequibo is a large part of Guyana, about 74% of Guyana. Over 100,000 Guyanese live in there. A lot of native Amerindians live there. Biodiversity, the resources in Esequibo. When you think of Esequibo in terms also of the other islands in the Caribbean, it is substantial. So it is not like a small piece of land that Venezuela is claiming, but it would impact life as we know it. So it is a very important case that we are facing today, the importance. And that's why I took my time to go through all of this and to make this educational piece that I think, you know, this is so important to Guyana as we know it and our resources. Next slide. So the court did, um in the recent provisional order, said that Venezuela should refrain from taking action that could modify the situation that currently prevails. So it shouldn't act on that referendum. And both parties should do things that might not aggravate or extend the dispute. Next slide. The separate opinion of Justice Robinson was interesting to me that he said, okay, while you agree with the order, he wanted to highlight that the court was kind of saying, okay, Guyana administers control over Esequibo, but Guyana has sovereignty over Esequibo. So that is different. This territory belongs to Guyana. He's already clear. He's reached his conclusion. This is Guyana's territory. So it's not just a piece of territory that you're not clear about ownership and we control. We own that. We exercise sovereignty over that area. That is the current status. Continue. So the most recent thing we heard from um, some of the other panelists about this declaration and whether it means anything. So it's not a treaty. It's non-binding. It's what you call soft law. But remember that courts can look at what? Subsequent practice of states. All right, so Article 31 of the Vienna Convention of Treaties, that you can look at things subsequent to inform what you mean, how you operate. It is for the states to decide their future. Whether they want to withdraw from the court or not, I would think that would be detrimental to this case. It would never end. This, this claim from Venezuela, I see some hope with the court and taking it to the court and getting a judgment in our favor there. But as to how that will be treated by the international community, by Venice. Well, Venezuela's already saying it's not going to respect the court. We already see how they're going to operate. But we have to like wait and see what will happen. Next slide. Right, so this is another part of the declaration that they go on to talk about the um, controversy and respecting the judgment of the court. So I think, I can imagine what Venezuela's going to want is to have Ghana withdraw from the court and say, let us settle it bilaterally but I wouldn't trust that because look at their actions in the past, right? Next slide. So the new reality, as we heard from some of the other panelists more recently is that threats continue. Surprise, surprise, <laughs> Venezuela. They're now saying, okay, this is disputed territory. And how do you treat with this? Or would Venezuela be free to 
but with Guyana, be free to have a military exercise in this area with other foreign states. As a sovereign state, there are certain things you should be able to do. You have sovereignty over the area, things you should be able to do. But when you say you have a disputed territory on international law, there are consequences that flow. Next slide. So my concluding remarks, international law is on Guyana's side. And this threat really affects our existence as we know it. So I think I went over time, so I'm just gonna end there. Thank you very much for the for me. Thank you, Dr. Elias Roberts, for that presentation. And thank you to each one of our panelists for such insightful and thought-provoking presentations. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from our panelists. It is now time to hear from you. So we've come to the question and answer portion of the evening. So if you have a question for our panelists, please raise your hands and we'll bring the mic to you. No, leave that. You can indicate by raising your hands. Don't be shy. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to hear this, I think, most interesting and helpful analytical survey of the issues before us. The panelists in their presentations put a number of issues before us, and I want to ask your permission to correct uh, what I would say three very important facts the other things which may which may have to do with the future issues of legal versus uh, political uh if time permits maybe i could come back to those but let me start by saying first of all that the government of guyana indicated to the court to indicated to the united nations secretary general in a process which most people ignore but the errors will arise and have arisen here because that process is ignored. After the good offices process, you had a process called enhanced mediation. It is one of the many listed. And if you don't take a that, put here that uh, changes have taken place, which in fact did not take place, that, that did not take place. Guyana was not in a position to turn to the court unless that process of enhanced mediation was completed. The Secretary General made that a condition, what he called the last, let us have the last dialogue or the last exchange to last for one year. In fact, he had to, re he had to repeat that last phase because Venezuela was blocking him. But that's not what I want to say. In 2014, not 2015, the government of Guyana called upon the Secretary General to move to a definitive settlement of the problem. And that definitive settlement was the court. 2014, oil was discovered in 2015. Guyana never went to the court until the process on, of enhanced mediation was completed. And it did so, the letter from the SG to the two parties saying you can go to the court now. So you're saying it's not the SG, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not Guyana, it's sorry, it is not, the SG who triggered it, in fact, it was the SG. There was a letter to the heads saying, this phase has shown that the two parties are getting wider apart, rather narrower, and therefore I have chosen the court as the means of resolution. That's the wording of the letter. So we went to the court not because, as Venezuela is saying, and uh, Professor, when you when you cast the, the, the issue as a matter of Guyana going there, it, it lends support to Venezuela's argument. We had a process of enhanced mediation embra embraced by Venezuela, which led nowhere. And therefore, the SG recognizing Einstein's contention that if you do one thing 9,000 times, for you to do it 
9,001 times and to expect a different solution is foolishness. He didn't quite use those terms. Lunacy, okay. So that is why the SG concluded that you have to go to the court. All the other elements of consequence have been exhausted. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a unilateral decision by Ghana or a decision triggered by Exxon. The people that were sp speaking to Exxon were speaking in 2015 and 2016. The request to move to the court took place with a different set of people, a different government in 2014. I want that to be clear. The other thing is, again, bear in mind, the dispute and um, controversy, we have spent a lot of time on this, as you would expect of Guyanese and Caribbean people over, over uh, epistemological things. But I'm, I'm going to say something about that in a second. But the, the thing I want to say is that 1899 looked at, not at the Essequibo, it looked at Barima Point and West, and largely the Orinoco, the, the Venezuelan argument, the Venezuelan argument that persuaded the United States to threaten to go to war had nothing to do with the Essequibo. It had to do with the Orinoco, because it, it is today, and it was then, one of the most important trade routes in the world. It remains that way. In terms of, in terms of value, it is extremely important because trade is dominated by the United States. World trade is dominated by the United States. The movement of goods for world trade to the US and to this part of the world is pretty significant. And therefore, you had actually a book called Empire on the Orinoco, which cataloged how a US congressman had managed to get a license to set up something on the Orinoco and that the US therefore had economic interests in having the Orinoco not controlled by Europeans, not controlled by Britain, and not being in a position to exclude the United States. I hope I'm making sense. There was an American interest, therefore, in the Orinoco. And we, therefore, shouldn't uh, labor under the misapprehension that the dispute was about Essequibo. Essequibo actually still remains insignificant, even as a river, compared to the Orinoco. It is small compared to the Orinoco. The depth, the business along the river are all, I wouldn't say insignificant, but they're not, they're not, it's nothing like the importance of the Orinoco in South America. Essequibo is small. So these are two, there, there are a couple of others, but let me, let me, let me um, for the moment leave it there because I've taken too long to explain those, explain those two. I can come back to the other activity if you like. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, sir. I would invite our panelists if they have any immediate reactions to that. I think it might be easier to go first. Um, I think I made eye contact with Mr. Greenwich when I was speaking about East Timor. I thought that he was standing to correct me. It's actually Indonesia, not Malaysia. But he's too kind to point that out, so I should take the opportunity to do so before someone else does. Uh, in relation to the issue of the Arnaco, of course, I think I may have referenced that the issues really weren't about east of the Schomburg line. It was really about the west of the Schomburg line. I, I leave the other one for better and braver souls. <laughs> just um, just to pick up on where um, <clears throat> Mr. Greenish took us on. I think Dr. Elias showed us some some maps about uh, in Africa and so on. Look, and the question that's been asked to me somewhere as, uh, as to why President Ali was only talking about the land boundary. The simple answer is that right now, what is before the court has to do with the land. But your claim to the sea space offshore is dependent on your ownership or sovereignty over the land. Because Venezuela feels that the Esquivo belongs to them, they have been taking the position 
that we shouldn't do anything offshore in terms of licenses and giving out concessions and so on. We take the other view, which is the status quo. And I pointed out to somebody the other day that um, when the provisional measures were handed down on the 3rd of December, the court didn't ask Guyana to vacate the executive The court said we have administrative control. Patrick Robinson, Justice Robinson is quite right. We have sovereignty. And if you look at how the courts operate, there's a view that you could make an, ex uh, an expression of an opinion at the provisional measure stage, which can subsequently be changed in a final decision. So he was asking himself, he wondered why his colleagues didn't want to go the full distance and use the word sovereignty. We have maintained over the years that since 1899, since 1905, the sovereignty of the Escobo is ours. And therefore, to that extent, we can give out whatever concession we want. We can tell ex ante bon jail wherever they want. Mr. Maduro's objection is based on the false premise that the territory is not kind. And this will just lead me to that clarification about the thing about controversy and dispute. You know, people, <laughs> I know, we must read, we must read. Look, yes, the Geneva Agreement doesn't mention border. It doesn't mention this, but it mentions frontier, right? That is the language that they choose. But the issue had to do with the controversy. And Mr. Greenwich and people will tell you that between 66 and 1970, the intention was not to reopen the dispute. They assembled two teams of people to go up to London to look at the British archives, just to look and see in the record if there's anything contrary to what had been decided in 1899 and 1905. The Venezuelans could produce nothing from their archives to show otherwise. That's why nothing happened for four years. We go and look at the sea maps. They're talking about land. These two completely different things. But if you see the way how things evolve over time. Um, the, the, the distinction has to be drawn between your claim to the territory and your claim to the waterway. The court is only going to decide on the Yesikibo. After that matter is settled, we would still have to sit down with our friends in Caracas to deal with the water space. Now, what we have done Mr. Gunish can correct me if I'm wrong. What we have done in the interim is to apply the general principles of international law. We ain't gonna do no wildness. I mean, the, I think the code of ours, sorry if I remember correctly, has some fundamental difference with ours, but let's leave that aside. There's certain general principles, like equity, equidistance. You follow the natural prolongation of the land. That's part of the problem with us of Venezuela. But if you look at the map on the top, what the player goes so. It's like an abutment sticking out. And if you're crafty, you draw the line going so, so we get all of this water. Venezuela, of course, chooses to draw the line so, so they get all of the water on the other side. I think what we've done, and I haven't dealt with this thing in decades, I think what we did is draw perpendicular and push off on the median, following the principles of international law. So Dr. Elias is right. Venezuela is that party to home close. And we know why. If you ask people like Barton Scotland, who were there before me negotiating the treaty, they will tell you they made it clear that that same Article 74 and that same Article 83 about dealing with spaces between opposite and adjacent coasts were not in keeping with their interests. They only signed something called the Final Act, which said they were there, they were present. They never signed the treaty, they never ratified the treaty. But that treaty was signed in 1982. 82, so now we're somewhat 40, 40 something years, the rules are starting to crystallize. Dr. Elias mentioned this thing about customary international law. There are some rules that were crystallizing even before Uncle. So Uncle was supposed to try and, and, and codify them. So things like equidistance and following the natural prolongation of the land territory have started to crystallize. So what we have done, notwithstanding Mr. Maduro's protestations, in the offshore area is in keeping with the general principles of international law. And when the court comes back, 
on the land territory and we sit down with Venezuela, we'll apply the same principles. I don't think anything will change fundamentally. I don't have a crystal ball. They will use a different methodology, just like what Suriname did. Suriname used a different methodology to draw the line and the, the International Tribunal and the Law of the Sea, I use it term loosely, put them in their place. Y'all watch now where Suriname is finding their oil. Look where they're finding their oil. It's just to the right of the line that the Law of the Sea Tribunal drew. And they wanted, and they, they wanted the line further this side. I guess they had better information than us, that they knew the oil was there. That's why they were interested in having a different line. The line that the Law of the Sea Tribunal drew, you look and see where Suriname is faced, just to the right, and Exxon operating on the other side. So there's some variables here. There's some principles to be applied. But let's not lose sight of the immediate issue, which is the land territory. When we deal with that, we have another issue to deal with, which is the water territory. But for the moment, I think we can proceed because we're applying the generally accepted rules of international law, notwithstanding the protestations from our friend on the other side of the um, of the border. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Birchman and Mr. Bissambar. I believe you have a question from senior counsel. I can have the microphone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my questions are directed to all members of the panel. Uh, first of all, um, Venezuela has declared that it will not recognize the jurisdiction of the ICG. I assume that they will maintain that position when the decision is delivered. So my question to the panel, what next? How is Guyana and what is the best way? Are there any recommended ways? Are there any ideas or considerations as to how we should approach the post decision? Venezuela has stated its position and we know um, that it's likely to maintain that. Second, <clears throat> I understand that Chevron is in the process of acquiring Hess if it has not already done so. And this is in relation to the Guyana um, interests or blocks. I also understand that Chevron has significant interest in Venezuela. So again to the panel, do you think that there are uh, any advantages perhaps that we can eke out of Chevron, uh, bearing in mind its, its, its position cross borders, straddling both, both countries in, in dispute? Or do you think that um, we would be, in fact, placed under further threat as a result of the Chevron's dominance. And we have to remember that um, Chevron really is motivated by money and not politics. And um, decisions by things like the ICJ and all of these things that um, dispute and controversy and all these things we're talking about. Thank you. So I'll invite members of the panel to respond to that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> with the Venezuelan government for quite some time about the appropriation of its assets and restrictions on its right to operate and serious disputes, I, I'm not sure that it necessarily breaks in our favor or necessarily adverse to us, uh, Chevron's entry into the fray. It does increase the interest of the United States government if, if that was necessary. And from appearances, that has been beneficial to us. In terms of Ghana's strategy of how to deal with the Venezuela as a rogue agent, following the ICJ's decision if it's favorable. I think our strategy so far is what we're most likely to continue, which is to scream to the high heavens, bang on the table, um, and get as much attention internationally. International attention is the most powerful thing in our favor. There's nothing wrong with it. Decisions with ICJ 
are not enforced by any army. They're enforced by the political sensitivity of states to the importance of appearing to be a good international citizen. And we have to make sure that it appears to Venezuela that it's in their interest to be a good international citizen and to respect the decision of the court. And that's why making sure the issue continues to get lots of attention in every capital where we have influence. All right, thank you for the question. I um, think that Chevron's role in Guyana could be advantageous as well as, it depends on the perspective, how you look at it, as in some respects disadvantageous. And Venezuela's um, policy with many international companies have changed over the years. They would invited many companies in the 80s to invest and then they had certain laws that were seen as draconian and not investor friendly. Many states felt it amounted to an expropriation of their investment and violation of bilateral investment treaties. A lot of arbitration has occurred in terms of international arbitration and decisions against the Venezuelan government to pay billions to various companies. I know including um, Exxon that most recently I was looking at some um, cases in the US where Exxon subsidiaries were trying to enforce judgment against Venezuela to collect billions of dollars from arbitral decisions. So right on the Orinoco side, they were over there and through new laws and regulations that affected their investments that were not friendly, increasing in taxes, requiring the national company to be involved, certain things that appear to be draconian and not within the interests of the investors, they've left. So, Venezuela is on a policy internally in terms of nationalizing a lot of the um, sectors, the, the energy sector, and how they treat with companies that choose to abide by their very draconian laws is something you have to watch and see because it can change with the political winds in Venezuela. It continues to change over the years. So it's like a watch and see game. In terms of um, what would happen after the judgment, it appears like highly likely that we're going to get a judgment in our favor before the International Court of Justice on the merits of the case. And if, you know, not surprisingly, Venezuela may not respect that judgment because they already say they don't respect the jurisdiction of the court. And what will we do? Um, Mr. Bissemba had referred to the UN Charter, making reference to Security Council and trying to get the Security Council to enforce judgments of the court maybe sanctions against Venezuela, which would be nothing new. And towing the line in terms of looking at what you have in terms of international law in your favor, because this is something we have to deal with. We're gonna to have to deal with Venezuela. So we have to be aware of the options that are available. And if there's any potential for friendly relations and compromise with how you delimit the borders, how you share, if you have reservoirs that straddle the, the territories, to document the resources properly because Trinidad has a unitization agreement with Venezuela and they're sharing in terms of the, the gas. So there is the possibility if you have the proper data to meet with them on that front and maybe have a different relation in the future. So that would be a utopian dream that we can meet, we can have proper documents and agree to develop resources jointly in the future. Yeah. I'm not, um, I'm not qualified to speak on the Chevron aspect, um, but on the first aspect. Senior Council, I thought we had dealt with that in my presentation about Article 94. Look, I, I don't know we don't for time, but let me answer the question with a, a, a small anecdote. In 1994, uh, myself and Minister Rohi went to the Northern Line Foreign Minister's Conference in Cairo. And we, as we would normally do, we would go there to try and get a paragraph in the declaration uh, about the territorial controversy. And of course, the first thing you do, I drafted it. The first thing you do, you run it by Venezuela. Coincidentally, hmm, there was a gentleman here who used to be the Venezuelan vice consul who had been posted to the embassy in Caracas, in Cairo, and he was able to get Venezuela to agree to what we put. But you got to get people to support you. Right? 
And so I had to, just me and the minister, I walk in the floor, go to some of the big boys in Africa. I remember distinctly late at night going to one of my colleagues. And he said, Neville, why are you wasting my time? You know whatever Guyana puts in that paragraph. So anyway, I won't call it, but we will agree to it. That was the kind of status and standing we had. The 94, just after the 93 elections, coming off of Dr. Shabadin being elected to the ICJ, Guyana punching above its weight. Look, for years, the government of Guyana kept Venezuela out of the non-aligned movement. You know why? Because we explained to them that the principles of non-alignment, such as non-interference in the eternal affairs of state, peaceful settlement of disputes, respect for sovereignty, Venezuela was not adhering to it. And for years, we were able to keep them. They never forgave us for it. That's why they now have an embassy in every CARICOM country to chip away at the kind of support and respect we had internationally. So we don't only have to depend on people in the Security Council. I gathered the other day, the Security Council, yes, them have the friends. We have our friends too. The information I got is that everybody in the Security Council spoke on our behalf except two countries. Them have the friends. We have the friends. Mr. Maduro was to go to Russia for Christmas. He didn't reach out to now. I know he's sick, the plane broke down, I don't know what. He didn't go. He got a phone call from Mr. Putin. So I tell me going for instructions. The Chinese issued a statement around the middle of December saying they respect borders and think the right thing, saying things in our favor. So I don't know that even if we get a judgment, as Ronald said, Russia is not going to vote for them. Look, none of us have a crystal ball. Miss Machado, who is the leading opposition contender, as publicly said, she preferred the ICJ route. And they must go and get their lawyers to fight the case. They put 40 million, I don't know, they put a set of money in the budget this year. In addition to the nonsense of what the escrivo, they put an amount of money for research. I don't know what they're gonna need it because they're gonna have to create that evidence. They gotta get the IT people to go and get parchment paper and so on to fabricate documents that give it come from hundred and something years ago. But it might be a positive sign that they're actually going to come to the court to defend their position. We don't know how, because the position is very weak. But what I'm saying to you is that we had friends out there in the international community. You know, when I was a young diplomat, I used, we used to be told, don't forget to mention the Venezuela issue when you're all out there, when you're drinking the whiskey and eating the orders. I sat at a dinner in The Hague decades ago. Next, anyway, the man is dead now. A blessed memory. A judge of the International Court of Justice. And we were told as young diplomats, give them the lecture. I gave the gentleman the lecture. You know what the man tell me? He said, listen to me. On the basis of the fact that Venezuela has taken so long to raise this claim, and on the basis of the fact that they're claiming more than half of your country, something must be wrong. The man make a decision, I'm just on the basis of what I told him. And I would imagine when we had Judge Shabadi there on the court, we were down the court in 1987, I had gone up to the UN to help in that campaign. We managed to unseat the Brazilian incumbent, never before done, the first English speaking court, English speaking judge on the ICJ. He would have been there for nine years. And if he had won a second term, there's a separate matter, would have been 18 years. In those 18 years, just like me sitting down at dinner next to a judge would have gotten that kind of reaction. I would imagine Judge Shabadin would have been able to prevail upon his colleagues and we would have more than likely have gotten a positive judgment. But when it is not stupid, as soon as we put Dr. Tavish Shabadin on the court, they put the judge. And just Aguilar, right? He served out a term of the other Latin American judge. So Dr. Shabdin was there with him for four years. And then Dr. Shabdin came off, he went to the Yugoslav Tribunal. But the point I'm making to you is that there are other ways 
objected Venezuela to comply with the decision of the court through diplomatic pressure, through the kinds of work that we used to do in the past. We just got to get back into that game. You know, we are in security council for two years. We use that to good advantage. We had friends in Africa. We had friends, we have friends in Asia and use them to good, good benefit. So that when in the past, when, you know, you know the Venezuelans used to tell us they got fed up at one stage of going to all parts of the globe. And when they finished going to talk about whatever, people say, and how is that matter with Guyana? How are y'all coming with that matter? Any progress? Because we had done the work to sensitize people that we had an issue with Venezuela and they were surprised, pleasantly surprised, that people all over the world were raising the issue with them, something that they didn't want to discuss. So Stephen, take heart. Um, there's still some possibilities for us to, to get a, a solution after the after the judgment comes back. All right, thank you very much. May I believe have uh, a question from Mr. Hughes. Sorry, yeah, I, I do. I, I just want to follow up in a little bit more granular um, form, the question put by senior counsel, which is this. The two significant elections in June in this year, Venezuela has elections and the United States have elections. 2025 is going to be a very significant year. If there is a change in regime in both of those jurisdictions um, and you get a right-wing government in Venezuela and you get a right-wing government in the United States, and we know that the right-wing government is Venezuela is more hawkish than the present regime. And we're also aware that if the incumbent, if it's a right-wing government in the United States, is not particularly interested in foreign policy, but is more interested in business. And if the new government in Venezuela says they will restore the licenses, permits, and contracts to American companies, and Venezuela, being as astute as it is, is not going to wait for the decision in 2025. We probably have a peremptory act that leaves the ICJ's decision merely as a piece of paper. What would you recommend? And I'm sorry, Mr. Greenwich is not here. What steps would you recommend? No, no, he's not on the panel. Um, but I, this is... It. <laughs> No, no. The, the the question the question is what steps, real steps, do you recommend we embark upon to forestall that? Because if Venezuela moves in the right political time and climate, we could protest as much as we want, we can sing kumbaya as much as we want, unless we have a real deterrent effect whether it's the presence of foreign military bases or whatever, what is our general, what is what are your general recommendations in that regard? To the panel and Mr. Greenwich. <laughs> I want to clarify something, uh, Nigel, because are you saying that, like I said, Ms. Machado has said she wants to go the ICJ route. We don't know what's going to happen there. The gentleman is in trouble. That's part of his desperation. She's doing extremely well. Are you saying that if she has said publicly that she prefers the matter to go to the ICJ, if the judgment comes out in our favor, she would not be bound by it? He has said he won't be bound. But it would be a little hypocritical of her to say, yes, let's go to the ICJ. And having gone to the... Two things. One... Uh, I, I just wish to refer to Bush Sr., read my lips, no new taxes, and we know what happened to him. So Ms. Machado can say the same thing. I prefer the ICJ and change her mind completely because American multinationals pouring new money into Venezuela will change most voices from the past. That's a fact. So all I'm saying is, whether it's Ms. Uh, whatever her name is, or a new president, if you have a right-wing government that enjoys the support of the majority of the U.S. Senate and a new U.S. president um, of different ideology, what steps should we be taking now to head off dealing with that practical reality? Because if Maduro knows he's going to lose, he's going to be preempted. He's going to probably take some border town or border towns and 
and gradually do that. So I'm just asking what steps should we be taking now apart from, you know, singing and objecting and whatever um, to address that issue. Yes, thank you. May I offer an observation to uh, the provocative question put by Nigel Hughes a minute ago? I think the first thing I want to say is that you recognize that the hazard that you've set out is one that I think uh, many of us share who are dealing with this issue. So there is a danger uh, along the lines that you, you're, uh, you've outlined. I would also say that in the period Certainly, 1962 to now, one of the things we we have learned is not to take anything that Venezuela says for granted. Uh, even even the issue of not depending on a third party to um, deal with the question of ter territorial disputes, they have settled agreement. They have settled borders with the United States, France, the Netherlands. Britain and so forth, uh, where third parties and even third party agencies have been involved. Although what is now being said is that they can't they can't deal with us on this matter um, through the ICJ. We have to do it directly bilaterally. But I think the 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 answer to the question is this: you can't even at this stage assume that since you have a strong case, and I wouldn't even go so far as to say we will win it because you can't, you can't swear for any court, but all right, other things being equal, it should be okay. But obviously, if Venezuela sees that, and that is in part why it's behaved the way it does, you have to redouble your efforts at the political and diplomatic level. And it is not clear to me, and I say this at considerable danger to that, I don't think we take this matter seriously enough. You have to invest more resources, human and financial resources, in both PR and the diplomatic offensive. You have to. You have to do a lot more. The difference, the, the point being raised by Neville, and I, I was amused to hear him argue that line, um, that the diplomatic initiative had paid off in the past. And the fact is you have no other option, certainly not by way of military. You certainly don't have the option of going and finding partners outside of the, whether it is Brazil, US and others in the region who may not in any case want to come to your rescue. So you have to be seen to be doing as much as you can with the resources that you have and those that you are capable of manipulating well. We have to do that. I mean, Venezuela itself is seeking entry, and, and this is also the, the music part, entry into the BRICS. Are we working on that grouping? We have to work on them so that everybody's aware that here is a, a lawbreaker, here is a state that has no respect for agreements that have been signed, and and um, the the number the number of agreements that have been that were outlined uh, in in the first presentation uh, that have been broken or under threat by Venezuela are only a fraction of those because if you were to abandon um, the the borders that we have now a whole set of agreements pre eighty nine pre eighty nine and afterwards will also have been thrown away. They also have to be thrown away. And the, of course, the, 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 the one establishing the, um, the boundaries between ourselves, Brazil, and, uh, and Venezuela have been mentioned. But there are others with other, with other agencies. The, the, the borders that came down from 19, from uh, 18, 1814, uh, and coming closer, involved other, other states. It's not merely Britain and Venezuela. 
So you have, a, you have the case of a state that respects no agreements and you therefore have to work on whoever you can speak to, whoever will listen to ensure that they anticipate the type of um, adverse or risks that may lie ahead of us. I think that is the only thing. There's no silver bullet. You have to work, you have to spend resources. If you are able or willing to spend resources on many other things that we see resources being spent on now, then expenditure on improving the quality of your diplomatic service, your political service, PR services elsewhere are going to be insignificant uh, compared to the damage that Venezuela could do. And you will try to undo after they've done that, that damage. You have to you have to invest in the appropriate initiatives now. That is that is all I would uh, want to say in that regard. It's not an easy answer, but uh, the question I I think recognized that it was not easy. Yeah. I would like to support Mr. Bissama Brother Bissam in what he said. I was in Moscow when we made Mr. Shahabuddin vote. He won the seat against the Brazilian candidate at the time. I was. I used to be invited by all the Muslim African brothers because I virtually became a Muslim for this purpose, <laughs> right? Huh? We had, we had to be, we worked hard because we were poor and we had to use whatever elements were at the disposal. No one of the elements was our PR among our African brothers. And we made it known that Mr. Mr. Shahabuddin was a Muslim and we behaved, I had to behave nearly like a Muslim. Thank you. Ladies, sorry, I, very quick because we are trespassing at the moment. <laughs> uh, can we get the microphone to the gentleman, please? Thank you very much. I'll be very brief. My question is with the advent of the Exxon. Um, oil and gas and Guyana discovery here, would it be prudent to conclude that maybe or perhaps that one of the main consideration was in anticipation of a border dispute that we would be able as a result of international investment law be protected by the United States being um, agent of Exxon, one, um, that's my main question. And what would be the consequential um, or the way forward if we are to rely on the United States in providing that form of protection for us what would be the cost benefit? Would there be an emergence of perhaps neo-imperialism? Um, what would be the pros and cons? But I guess we can build on this discussion in, in substantiating the this type of trajectory that you know I'm I'm I've gathering from this forum. Thank you very much. I think I'm not in Tangal, I'm not on the panel. I, I don't know if anybody uh, <laughs> from the panel wants to discuss that, but we take the recommendations maybe, for the next gathering. Yeah, and, and Dr. Elias, of course, uh, has taught as well in international investment law and oil and gas. Thank you very much. So she may want to answer that. I, I suspect part of that was rhetorical. Do, do, do you, <laughs> were you, uh, would you prefer a response or? Uh, Anybody? Patrick, Patrick I, 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 no, I'm sorry. I, I, can't, I couldn't even understand what you were saying about the U.S. government 
becoming an agent of a private corporation. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't make, I, I couldn't follow you. I'm sorry. Okay. On that note, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this, this has been certainly speaking personally, this has been a most edifying uh, afternoon. Um, I'm hope that those in the diaspora who have been looking at this, those who've been looking at this online, um, I have not seen so much information shared and bundled so efficiently in such a, such a short period of time. All of us, I'm sure, have other questions. I think we are better positioned to analyze what is likely to happen in the future, or certainly to understand what is thrown at us, depending on where it comes from. And I want to start off by thanking the good members of the panel, um, only by virtue of distance, I think Ronald Bertsmith really raised the real issue of the day. It's not so much what the decision is going to be, it's the real politics. And at the end of the day, what started as a political dis this, this, uh, dispute got elevated to a legal, and then you're probably back at the political. Ronald, I thank you. So please put your hands together for Ronald Bertsmith. Um, like so many of our talented children, we regret that they're not here. She's in Trinidad, head of the faculty, but so many have left us in circumstances which, in which they could not, they had no control over. Um, and we would have been a much richer place were they to be here. Dr. Elias, I think from the time she was doing her first degree, distinguished herself as an extraordinary academic. Um, she went to the finest educational institu uh, institutions and distinguished herself there. Uh, she's now Professor Elias, heading uh, the law faculty, dean of the law faculty in the University of the West Indies. And I know I share and express your view and I say, if we had 10% of the real talent that we have been voluntarily exported here in Guyana, we probably not even have been where we, where we are today. But this is an extraordinary sister and talent. Please put your hands together for Professor Gisbert. I, I know that um, Mr. Basemba was looking for companies saying that we went to the same extra lessons. Yes, we did. <laughs> I just turned 60, but he was many years ahead of me. <laughs> so um, I, I called up, so I, Actually, I should just share briefly how this started. I started posting, you know, asking for a friend on the um, on Facebook, and there were several points that came up in relation to this dispute, and Neville would respond. And and you know, unfortunately, the Ghana social media culture is is rudimentary, it's basic, it is crude, and this was one of the rare occasions that the engagement was, hey, let's look at this, um, because people followed friends for life followed over Facebook quiz. And he was very constructive and um, we got, we ended up in discussion and um, I said to him, look, one day we, we have this um, panel that's coming up because there's so much misunderstanding as you probably have gathered after this presentation tonight um, about what went on. And he said, sure, no problem. I know um, he referred to schools and then I went to break down. I would only say that Guyana is where it is because it had too many QC people as heads of state. Be that as it may, I don't know if he's confirming that uh, <laughs> QC had girls in his time, but so be it. I just wanted to know that it wasn't quiet when he went there. But again, we, we mentioned just a few of the outstanding um, uh, persons who have contributed, Dr. Shahab, and we, we have relatives of him here with us. And it is my hope as we go forward um, today, I'm happy that uh, Michael, who moderated the session, was one of Ghana's finest and best. He's back here now, and I hope the circumstances continue to keep him here. So can you put your hands together for Michael? And to you, the audience, for the first Friday after the new year, to spend it with us for three, year, for three hours. We deeply appreciate that. And a minuscule thank you is uh, we've got some refreshments over there. But to everybody, whether present here or in the internet, thank you very much. We hope to continue this in our effort to share knowledge. Thank you so much and good night.